All right, and we'll just briefly, if you've already joined us, we'll just wait for a critical mass of us to enter the Zoom space and then we'll jump in. If you're already here, it's nice to be with you. Thanks for joining us this Friday evening. Do you think we should do some patter? People are coming in. Kirsten, are you ready? Are you up for patter or do you just want to center yourself? Sure, we can patter. I think we can actually go ahead and get started as folks continue to join us and then we'll save the patter. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller at Politics and Prose. We're live with Kirsten Valdez Quaid and Claire Bay Watkins discussing the five wounds. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. If you'd like to enable the captions, click the CC live transcript bu button at the bottom of the screen. And before we start, we do want to thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really thankful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Kirsten Valdez Quaid is the author of The Five Wounds and Night at the Fiestas, winner of the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Prize. She is the recipient of a Five Under 35 award from the National Book Foundation, the Rome Prize, and the Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Her work has appeared in the New Yorker, New York Times, The Best American Short Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, and elsewhere. Originally from New Mexico, she now lives in New Jersey and teaches at Princeton University. And Claire Vay Watkins is the author of the novel Gold Fame Citrus and the short story collection Battleborn, winner of the Story Prize, the Dylan Thomas Prize, the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award, and the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, among other prizes. A National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree, Watkins is a professor at the University of California, Irvine, and lives in 29 Palms, California. In the Five Wounds, it's Holy Week in the small town of Las Penas, New Mexico, and 33-year-old unemployed Amadeo Padilla has been given the part of Jesus in the Good Friday procession. He's preparing feverishly for this role when his 15-year-old daughter, Angel, shows up pregnant on his doorstep and disrupts his plans for personal redemption. With weeks to go until her due date, tough Ebulian Angel has fled her mother's house, setting her life on a startling new path. Vivid, tender, funny, and beautifully rendered, The Five Wounds spans the baby's first year as five generations of the Padilla family converge. Amadeo's mother, Yolanda, reeling from a recent discovery, Angel's mother, Marissa, whom Angel isn't speaking to, and disapproving Tive, Yolanda's uncle and keeper of the family's history. Each brings expectations that Amadeo, who often solves his problems with a beer in his hand, doesn't think he can live up to. The Five Wounds is a miraculous debut novel from a writer whose stories have been hailed as legitimate masterpieces by the New York Times. Kirsten Valdez Quaid conjures characters that will linger long after the final page, bringing to life their struggles to parent children they may not be equipped to save. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Kirsten Valdez Quaid and Claire Bay Watkins. Thank you both. Thank you, Julia. Hi, Claire. Hello. Hi. Thank you, Julia. That was fabulous. And congratulations, Kirsten, on this novel. It's stunning. And it is huge and immersive and virtuosic. It's so um, lucky for us to finally have a novel from you. Um, I wanna know how you're feeling. I wanna hear about how this book came to be. I wanna hear about how you captured the music of this particular New Mexico, especially. So I thought maybe we could start there and you would just read a bit and we could hear that. And, and I think our viewers, who we can't see in a weird, like perfect <laughs> encapsulation of this like uncanny valley time of our life. Um, I think they'll really like to hear your music too. Sure, I'm glad to read. Um, first of all, I just wanna thank Politics and Prose for having me and Julia for hosting this and Chelsea. And um, it's 
it's such a joy to be here with Claire, who's one of my favorite writers, so what a treat. Um, well, Julia gave a really good um, introduction to the novel. Um, so I'm going to read a section from Angel's point of view. Um, and this is, um, the scene takes place at Smart Starts, which is the teen parent program um, that she's a part of. Angel pinches the underside of her chin as she thinks. It's journaling time, and Brianna has told them to make a list of things they each need to make their own and their baby's lives better. The first few are easy. One, GED or high school diploma and college degree. Two, a support system. Three, a car. Four, a driver's license. Five, a job. Here, Angel is stumped. If she got a job, who would take care of the baby? So she adds six, free babysitter, a good one. But there is no such thing, not really, not unless your mom or grandma doesn't work. Even Angel knows that. Briefly, she considers her father, then dismisses the thought. Christy and Trinity are whispering. They are best friends and knew each other from before Smart starts. We got pregnant like the same month, they're always telling people, which is either a crazy fluke or an organizational feat. Both possibilities depress Angel. Who'd like to share us? asks Brianna. Today, she wears her clunky sandals and a shapeless maroon sweater dress that is too heavy for outside. Jen raises her hand, tucking her silky, mousy hair behind her large white ear, preparing herself for the stage. An education. Jen smiles, anticipating Brianna's praise. Right, draws Lizette. Education. I forgot that one. Angel grins and tries to telegraph her approval to Lizette, but Lizette's beautiful green eyes are half-closed like a lizard's. On her left hand, Jen wears a promise ring with a dinky little amethyst. It's my birthstone, she said, as if none of the rest of them were born in months with birthstones. She is going to marry her boyfriend, Jared, whom she met at church, and who picks her up every afternoon when Smart Starts lets out. Angel's stomach churns whenever she thinks of her own child's father, Ryan Johnson, the way in geometry he always sat in the front row grimacing up at the board. He always raised his hand to answer questions, but was only correct about 50% of the time. It seemed crazy to Angel to keep putting yourself out there like that, but the next time Mrs. Esposito asked a question, there he was, long skinny arms swinging in, swinging in the air. Hey, he told her breathlessly once in the hall after class, I thought of a name for you, a math name. For weeks he called her Angle, or sometimes, delighting himself still further, obtuse angle. He was so persistent she felt embarrassed for him, which, along with the tequila shots, explains why she slept with him. Her embarrassment also explains, perhaps, why she hasn't told him the baby is his. So that's it. That's a bit of Angel. I love Angel. I'm so glad to hear you. Um, read her to us. She's stunning. She has some of the best lines in the whole book. I love the way that she relates to her unborn child. The moment she tells her, her dad that she won't drink Coke because it'll dissolve the baby's bones, right? Or that moment where she's talking about how isn't it strange that she's got a little penis inside of her? <laughs> like she's so, um, brilliant and like a, a visionary person. And I feel like, I told you this before, but I feel like I, my high school and her high school have the same architect, like the way that you <laughs> render that place, Española High School. Um, yeah, it's so vivid. Will you tell us like just a little bit about how this story came to you and where it came together? I know you're from New Mexico and it has like, you know, authority galore, but like where, what specifically drew you or where did it begin? You know, I think like, like any story, it, there were so many different threads of inspiration. Um, part of it is, yeah, um, I, you know, I, I, my subject is mostly New Mexico and I write a lot about the sort of rituals and Catholicism of the New Mexico I grew up with. Um, and part of that is this, um, you know, the tradition of 
penitentes. Um, um, so I've, I've always been interested in, in that and the kind of, um, you know, these lay communities that, that worship together and do these um, processions. Um, and I'm interested in the, the sort of, yeah, d depth of belief and need and desire and ed everything that would, must be behind um, the, the kind of physical penance that is, is part of that. Um, when I started writing the, the book, I was also working for um, a nonprofit in Tucson that was focused on raising the quality of early childhood education and supporting families. And I did a site visit to um, a teen parent program that is not unlike Smart Starts. Um, I think maybe the, the teachers are a little more competent than, than Brianna, <laughs> ultimately. But um, she, there, I was, I was just so struck by these girls who were, you know, on, they were kids and they talked like kids and they were also incredibly mature and so aware of, of the weight of responsibility that, that they had. And, and they really took the parent education part of the, of the curriculum so seriously. And I, I was just incredibly moved um, by these girls and, and they were also just, hilarious and funny and you know so um I gave I one of the girls was flipping through a magazine and she said oh that heifer is going home and I, I put that line in Angel's mouth that night and that's when she sort of began to become herself yeah and she's so hard to um pin down you know and um I love the way that like we have all these moments in the prose we'll say like angel is not this you know or um so and so is not this like it is like there's they themselves are aware of like the stereotypes that might be foist upon them and are like them not I'm, this is like a, these are like uncategorizable really rich complicated people who are like so um lovingly drawn in their flaws, like in their wounds, you know, that seems like one of the characteristics of your writing that they can all be so themselves. It's, it's really fond and loving. And I, and I can hear like that you hear this place, like, I mean, I, I do you feel like when you hit a line, like I'm thinking about the moment, I think it's Yolanda when she pulls, somebody pulls up and she says, is it Wope? someone's here is that it oh maybe <laughs> yeah 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 and I realized like oh I, I've heard that in New Mexico and I never even realized I had heard it or like do you feel a little um synesthesia or like tingly sensation when you get that music exactly right or um is it something that kind of comes like from you know this like I mean the way you describe this like magpieing Thing, like you overhear this and then it goes like, do you feel that right right when that girl says it and then you can feel every time you're playing that tune throughout like a pitchfork or something I don't know you know I think it's a combination I think sometimes you know at, at points in the drafting the characters didn't sound like themselves and I would read over it and I would be like that this isn't right these characters sound like you know Angel is sounding like some other kid in this moment. And then, you know, then I have to go back and edit it consciously. And then I think sometimes the, I, I do hear the voices um, the, way they, the way they should be. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know Wope was a New Mexico thing. I, I think also there are some things, that, you know, I don't hear. I didn't, I mean, I was an adult before I knew that my grandparents had accents. I never, I still can't hear it. Mm -hmm. um, it had to be pointed out to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how long did this take you to write, and what was writing it like for you? Oh my God, I took it took me forever to write. I started writing it in, 
I mean, it, so it's based on a story that was published in 2009, um, but that story remained a story for two years. And then um, I, it, the summer of 2011, I started writing it as a novel. Um, so it's been, it's been a long time with these characters. And yeah, and they feel, I mean, they feel like, they feel like, you know, members of my family at this point because they, they've been yeah. looking around so long. Um, well, me too. I mean, just reading them, it's such an immersive world. Like I almost like, <laughs> like being at, at, at Easter dinner at Yolanda's is like, I'm like, I did so much work to get out of my codependent family. And now I'm like, <laughs> back in here with Yolanda, like, please don't make me go back in here. But then I also, I want her to do what she does. And the family dynamics are so keen and um, beautiful, just like, just really, really stunning. Um, who, who was the hardest to write of all of these focal characters? Cause it's a really like um, polysymphonic novel. You inhabit so many different people. Yeah, there are a lot of points of view. Um, well, four points of view. Mm -hmm. um, Amadeo was was the hardest for me to write and I think it's because I really judged him in the beginning and I wanted him to get his comeuppance I wanted the the book to punish him and um mm -hmm. and yeah and you know it's the same anytime I've started a story out of revenge it just doesn't work it's, it's, it's um you know can that can give a little bit of of energy to the writing in the beginning but it doesn't make for good fiction um so it, it took me time to quit judging him and to like actually allow myself to become him I mean it was unpleasant at points because because I did judge him you know he's he's a really flawed guy he's yeah. an alcoholic he's you know has not been present in his daughter's life he's been mm -hmm. violent um he has some rage mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. he's you know mooches off of his mother um but you know as the more time i spent with him the more you know i, re I really love him now i see he can be funny he can he, mm -hmm. you know he has a a warmth and a charm and i think what sort of does keep me on his side ultimately is that he wants to do better. I mean, and he takes that seriously. Yeah, right. He's like a classic case of like doing the wrong things for the right reason or, or, or inverse. And he also is compelling to me as much as I'm like repulsed by aspects of him like that when he notices that his sister is, you know, bearable to be around because she's been abused by her husband and is he's able to like as I read it at least it's like he knows that he can manipulate and control her with that right like it's amazing the depth of compassion and and love that you can still feel for him and for me it was partly because he like has this calling you know like he asked for the nails and uh, he doesn't he may not be able to say why but um there's something um I don't know. I mean, your book encourages this kind of thinking because the whole family gets to roll around these ideas. Like, what are these rituals now? What are we now as a community? Um, the book spends like more time looking at at heroin than like the mountains and the those type of like touristic impulses to New to Mexico culture. It's not going to indulge. It's like go to Taos if you want that kind of book. Um, I don't really have a question there. I'm just waxing because I loved it. Loved it so much. Oh, this is what I do want to know though, because it was very gnarly for me to try to figure out how to how to write a novel after writing stories so much. So how'd you go about that transition from mastering this form, um, legit masterpieces, and then what, how did you teach yourself how to write novels? I mean, this is, I've written one novel now and, um, <laughs> and I approached it the same way I approach my short stories, which is like having zero plan and just, you know, 
spending time with the characters and following them and mm -hmm. meandering around and hoping the story will emerge. And, um, and that was a completely inefficient way <laughs> of approaching a novel. Like it, it can mm -hmm. work with a story because it's, you know, 25 pages and eventually you do hit upon the shape of the story. Um, it was a little, it was trickier with the novel. Um, you know, there are some things I, I knew that it would, early on I decided that it would take place over the course of one year in this family's life. So that was, that was a helpful constraint. And mm -hmm. I knew basically where I wanted people to end up emotionally by the end, mm -hmm. but not, not entirely. And, and I had no idea what would happen along the way. So, um, you know, eventually as with the stories, I got there, but you know, like I said, I, I started this in 2011. So, um, there were, and there were definitely wrong turns and subplots that I, you know, just weren't working that I pulled out. And, um, mm. so it was, it was a, it was tricky. Um, how was it for you? Yeah, it was very tricky and it takes time, of course, you know, and you can tell that like you're very careful and it takes time to make something that feels this real and is this interesting and beautiful, you know, so um, I'm not surprised that it did take a while because you, you can see how I think quick books feel quick, you know, um, so, but you, you've like made this like organic shape because you haven't ha you didn't have this like agenda and then and that also like it seems like it allows the characters to think for themselves about um what it means like they're rolling around this like meaning and they have their own internal clocks like the pregnancy you know right the first time we see angel her um you have this great image of her jeans being splayed open and like indicating down to um how this happened in her father's um conception of it yeah I think it once I got the hang of that I could be lost and that was actually going according to plan then I felt felt fine but I certainly could never hold a whole novel like plot in my head ever and it really freaked me out like I was like a kid who yeah. couldn't like go like the side of the pool right and then get to the other side and be like I don't know how we're gonna get there but um but we do no, and the timeline felt really thorny too. I mean, I kept having to map it out and there were, like you said, there were these internal clocks, like the, the child is born and he needs to develop it yes. mm -hmm. <laughs> on a certain, a certain schedule and, you know, the year progresses and the holidays mm -hmm. pop up and, um, but yeah, I kept, I kept having to you know, it was like, I was constantly doing math and it was really yeah, to hold all these threads. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Like what time is it for this person now? Like how much have I advanced things forward? Did you actually like map it out at all in other like spatial, sometimes where writers get weird, like spreadsheets or timelines or, you know, Kurt Vonnegut drawing all the way around his room or something like that. Did you have any wacky timekeeping devices? No, I had like a timeline and another word document that you know, mm -hmm. and every time I changed something, everything else would have to change. So it was all a tangle. Um, <laughs> I mean, I have like um, novel writing PTSD, just hearing you say, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Did you discover yeah. any, oh, sorry. No, I just wanted to know if you um, discovered anything about, about like the novel as a form that you think is, um, maybe like different or special compared to the story that the story couldn't do or something that you could do as a writer in this bigger, longer, you know, you have such a huge canvas here, obviously that's, but your stories do that too. What do you think? Is there something about the form itself that surprised you? Well, you know, in my stories, I never, I'm, I'm only ever in one person's point of view. Um, mm -hmm. So it was really fun to embody all these different characters and and think about i mean i do think i'm i'm always thinking about you know how the other characters in the room are responding to the situation but um you know i got to actually be in their brains and and walk with them um so yeah that's a total 
delight. Um, and the characters, you know, the angel in the short story that was published is, I mean, she's the same person, but she's, when I wrote that story, I didn't know her the way I know her now. And she surprised me. I mean, she falls in love with another mother in her teen parent program. And, um, you know, she's, she's obviously, you know, she's a teen mother. So she started having sex, um, on the young side, but she, you know, she hasn't given much thought to her own desire. And so that's part of what she's, she's figuring out. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that Amadeo is a romantic. Um, turns out he is that, that really surprised me. Mm. Um, as far as the novel as a form, I mean, there are so many kinds of novels, you know, they're, such slender novels that take place in a single day and a single mind. Um, right, of course, yeah. And then there are, there can be stories that are sprawled across generations and um, completely omniscient. And you know, yeah, yeah. There, of course. What can we really say about these forms? Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about your rendering of Angel when you were talking about her sort of like coming into her own, in terms of like an embodied experience and she's having to do this in the background of you know there are no virgin there are no marys in her father's um her his church right like there's no women allowed in these places there's um she's not supposed to walk up by him when he's doing his procession with the cross um she's likes sex um she there, there she uh her friend calls her a slut so harshly and and she's thinking about like you know slut shaming in the context of uh, of like how she was born and um it's like that's what that's what who i was thinking of most of all when when you refusing to be um, one dimensional, right? You sort of like invite someone to think something about an angel, you know, and then she has all of these other um, surprising facets that she's so alive. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. she pushes back against that. She, you know, she against, you know, her friend calling her a slut and, um, but she, she absorbs it too. I mean, she, oh, yeah. she, can't not I mean her she she senses the judgment from her her mother from her mother's boyfriend from her father from her grandparents you know so she she I think she's sort of juggling you know how she feels about her sexuality and um and you know what the real life consequences are um and also you know how the the people around her are are interpreting it and interpreting her mm -hmm. right yeah she's she's so she's so rich and she and yolanda both have this way of finding power like within the systems as they can like by keeping secrets or controlling when they distribute information or by like being silent withholding um their services and their love i love the image of like the space being feminized when when she returns home um so when you think about like um the meaning level of your work where does that come in for you um because obviously these characters are symbolic thinkers they're working in like rich image systems like they're aware that they're kind of in, in a not an allegory, but they're allegorical thinkers, it feels like to me. Do you um, focus on that, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs with like, you know, clarity first and then sensation and then meaning? Or do you think, you know, I want to wrestle with some of these like big concepts and let me find people who might be interested in that too? No, I think the meaning comes after. I mean, obviously in the beginning, you know, Amadeo is playing the role of Jesus. So there is this story um, that this old Slightly story. intertextual. <laughs> yeah. So he's, 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 
you know, reading into this story and reading himself into this this old story of of Jesus's life and death. And um, but you know that he. You know, I, I don't know that he's, he has very, he has many different readings of the story over the course of, of the novel. And, you know, some of them, um, I don't want to say that he, his readings are wrong, but yeah, I mean, he, he has all kinds of interpretations of that. So yeah, obviously there, there, um, you know, there is going to be some, some weight because that, I mean, that was, that was part of the fun of it for me was, um, engaging with this very old foundational story that, you know, is, is so well known and so revered by many people. Um, and, um, but, but as far, I mean, it's, it's always the characters that's, um, yeah, and then the, the meaning, I don't even, I don't always even know what it means. Like often it's my readers who will make these connections for me after. And, um, and you just say like, yes, of course, of course, I knew all about that, yeah. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's almost like it's, I feel like it's sort of none of my beeswax, you know, like I'm just working, I just, it's so hard to make something feel real and people behave like actual people and yet be surprising and have it sound beautiful and be, you know, deathless. <laughs> that it's like, I can't be, I can't worry about that um, writing my own five paragraph essay or whatever it is about. I mean, yeah, and like you reduction. run the risk, you run the risk of your characters just being these cardboard yeah cutout, yeah these mm -hmm. allegorical figures which you know I'm not very interested in um mm -hmm. as a reader I, mm -hmm. yeah um, no no of course not I mean yeah you can see because your characters are just like um just constantly surprising and yet I'm never suspicious like I'm, I'm not like oh Amadeo is not going to do that I'm like this guy could do anything yeah um partly because of like the pain that's in there I think it's a very like animating active force like the wound is a um driver it's like an engine or something here you know um I thought there, I, I noticed a good question in the Q&A that I wanted to put to you. What did you learn about yourself writing this book? Well, I guess I learned that I, I actually could finish a novel, which I, I think I wasn't, even though I was working toward it and I, 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 I sort of knew that I would finish it. I, I don't think I truly understood it until um, I got to the end of the draft. And then I was like, Oh, <laughs> some part of me didn't believe it. Um, when did that happen? Um, like, was there a point when you're like, oh my God, I might actually pull this off, but you knew you had, you know, 50 more pages or something to do that? Or it was it truly the very, very end? And you're like, oh, I did, I did it all. Was there a point where you're like, viability, I have crossed the threshold here? No, I mean, I think it all, you know, felt vi more or less viable most of the time except when I was in total despair but um, <laughs> that's what I want to hear about <laughs> when I when I actually had a full draft because I'm a writer who you know I, I revise as I go mm -hmm. and I'm constantly changing what came before so it it was deep deep into the years when I finally just had a complete draft and I knew it wasn't finished I knew you know it was fairly polished um it was quite polished, but it was, it was bloated. It was, you know, way too long. Um, and, but yeah, so it was before I actually had a full novel, a lot of time had passed. Um, there were always, you know, scenes still to write. Um, somebody mm -hmm. asked, did you stop and start or did you just write yeah, and yeah. rewrite and rewrite? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the middle of the, I, I published my first book during the time that I was working on this. So, you know, I was, I was writing stories in between and, you know, doing revising and writing essays. So I wasn't working only on this. Um, 
but it was it was always going. Did your time away help or hurt? If you can say, of course, that's probably, it's probably like both, but did you find it refreshing to take a break and get fresh eyes? Or was it like, I wish I didn't have to repick up this thread. Who was I, who is this person again? What were you doing? I think, I don't know. You know, I, um, I remember in a workshop, Adam Johnson said, don't cheat on your novel. And oh my. all I do is cheat on. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't feel like Angel would subscribe to that monogamy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Angel would push against that. No, I mean, I, I'm constantly cheating. I mean, even when I'm writing a short story, I'm cheating on, on any number of other short stories. So, um, yeah. And literature is like you're cheating on your real job that you're supposed to have, right? Like the whole exactly. thing is like a bit of a, a fugitive endeavor anyway. So, yeah, I'm going to cheat on my short stories with a poem, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm teaching on my grading by, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating on my grading by, <laughs> by writing. Right, of course. Yeah, I mean, hmm, yeah, that's a whole deal, right? How the, like teaching comes in. Um, okay, I'm looking at the chat to get some, I also want to hear the answer to this question. Why did you choose to have Yolanda keep her news a secret? You know, I think Yolanda, so it, it's not for those of you who um, don't know. So Yolanda finds out early in the novel that she is dying. She has um, a brain tumor and um, she's she doesn't have long to live. Um, you know, Yolanda's the matriarch. She's the center. She holds everybody together. She's the, the one person with a job um, and health insurance and... Um, she has spent her whole life caring for her family members. She looks out for her uncle. She, you know, is still supporting her adult son. She then supports her, her granddaughter and her great grandson. Um, I think her decision to not tell them is, it's really about sort of holding on to something for herself. She, I think she sort of holds that secret close like a, a treasure. Um, and there, you know, there's a moment early in the book when she's about to tell them and Amadeo has a big tantrum and sort of takes the stage and she finds herself resenting him for that. Um, you know, so yeah, I think she, I think she just, she needs to have this, deal with this thing privately um, before her offspring make it about them. Because um, mm -hmm. when he does find out, you know, Amadeo feels betrayed that she's leaving him. You know, he's he's so shocked and and heartbroken. And, but you know, he's thinking about himself. Yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions about um, the New Mexican, New Mexican setting. Um, what are your, some of your favorite environmental images? And we have a former student of yours too, who has also, you've spoken to about writing and the landscape of New Mexico. Um, so uh, what are some of the ways that the, the idea of place and home are in your novel? Well, I mean, when I, when I write about New Mexico, it's, it's always a, a bit of a complicated, my relationship to it is, is a bit complicated. Um, you know, my, my family is from there and, um, have been there for hundreds of years. And so there's this sense of deep history in this place. And I, I'm very close to my grandparents. I was really close to my great grandmother. She used to take care of me when I was little. And so when, when she would tell me a story from her childhood, like suddenly that's just like a jump of <laughs> almost a century. She was born in um, 1898. So it's, I, I really have always had this deep, deep connection to the place in the sense that this is where I am from and this is who I am. Um, but we moved when I was a kid and we moved a lot and we're constantly on the road. Um, we 
as you know, Claire, we lived for a time in Pahrump when I was a kid. You know, we lived all over the Southwest and, um, and you know, we lived out of, you know, we go months at a time living out of a tent or out of our Volkswagen van um, in, in a bunch of different communities. So I, I was constantly sort of trying to figure out where I belonged and it was always clear to me from, from the earliest from when we, you know, the when we first left, that like home was New Mexico, and that I I should be there, and mm -hmm. there's always this sense that if things were right, I would be back there, um, and I was sort of waiting for the time to go back, and you know, I go back and visit all the time, but I don't, um, I I don't live there full time, um, sadly. So it it's like it sounds like this extremely rare case i mean yeah many many generations for those of our guests who are on the east coast it's so rare in the american west um you know my family's lived in nevada for two generations and it's like old old timers you know and yet yeah, you've also had this again characteristic sort of like transient um the wallace stegner type of of childhood where you're you're romping along and that it's characterized by movement and that really makes me understand and appreciate this position of um, maybe, I don't know if these are the right words, but like um, elegy or, or even exile, a sense of like writing as longing for it. And um, that to me is what makes it so um, like powerfully immersive to be in when you're, when you're reading your work, um, there's this like, urgent type of um like a prayer I guess is partly what I'm thinking about you know like yeah. I may not maybe I can't be with you but I will dedicate you know this is my devotion does it feel that way at all for you yeah I think it does in some way I mean it's and it also feels you know when I go back and I do go this is I haven't been back since last January and it's one of the longest times mm -hmm. um, I've been away um, it's you know I'm, I'm constantly seeing so I, I usually go back to Santa Fe where my grandmother lives and so I'm seeing it as it is I see you know the, the Trader Joe's and the gas station and you know I see contemporary Santa Fe and then I'm also you know, when I drive around, I see my grandfather was a stonemason. And so I see the coping on the library that he did. And, you know, this wall or that, that I know that there's a fireplace in that house that he built. And, you know, so it's, it's like these layers of transparencies. Um, and, and yeah, it's this real sense that, you know, the, certainly the Santa Fe that I knew as a kid is gone, but, you know, it changes so much so quickly. And, um, but the, you know, and all this, the, the Santa Fe, the New Mexico, the stories of, of my mother and of my grandparents. And, you know, they're, they're present, but they're also vanished. Um, so there is this sense that I want to hold on to it. Um, it's also a place that I think people want to leave. You know, it's heavily romanticized. People adore it. People want to stay. And then I think, you know, I've seen it in my family, people really wanting to get out and explore. Um, and I think, you know, Amadeo feels that, Angel feels that. There's this real desire to, to yeah, to have, have, see different ways of living. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, we're getting close on more question time. I know we've been sort of freely dipping in and out of the questions, but now I want to officially invite everybody. Um, and I think, I, I might be wrong, but I think that Julia might even come in and do some question I'm wrangling, Julia. Oh, and we have a special announcement, of course. How could I forget that? Um, hello, everyone. We do encourage you to keep typing your questions into the Q&A box. We'll get to a few more of those. But before we do, um, we did want to mention that those who purchase a copy of The Five Wounds with this event tonight, 
we're all entered into a raffle to receive a pair of earrings inspired by the artwork on the cover. Um, we're happy to announce that the recipient of those is Jay Lee in Los Angeles, California. Jay, if you're out there, hello. Um, we'll be sending those along your way. Um, so congratulations to you. Um, and thanks very much for this fun raffle for this event tonight. Um, and thank the two of you. This is such an engaging conversation. So as folks continue to add their questions to the q and um, I'll just fire a few your way. Um, Kirsten, there's a question. What's your favorite time of day to write? And what do you like to have with or around you when you work? The morning is the best time for me before, you know, my brain gets cluttered. Um, I have all kinds of things around me on my desk, you know, little <laughs> rocks and things. But really, really, I just, I, I do like a window. Yeah, I'm happy if I've, I've got a window. And maybe some post-it notes so I can write notes to myself. What kind of notes? Oh, if I, I don't know, I have to remember something. Um, not, not good notes. <laughs> <laughs> no? Like <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> okay, this is another question I want to ask you on behalf of the student who you spoke to before. And she talked, she wanted to know about the difference between advice you might give the student and someone like a new writer who's been more established versus a student. And I wanted to know about when you say before your mind gets too cluttered. I know, I don't think that you're on any social media. Is that one way that you keep your mind clutter free and how else? How do you tend and upkeep your special sensibility for all the, perhaps, especially for all the students out there? I'm not on social media. Um, I, uh, I have to disable my internet before I write and cause I'm very distractible. And I also lock up my phone. I've got a, mm. a lock box. It's called the kitchen safe and it was designed for dieters. And it's got a, a little timer on it. And so I put my phone in there. And I feel such a sense of well-being when I hear that lock engage because I just, I can't email at that point. Um, yeah. Let's see, the best advice I would give to aspiring writers, um, I think, so for for this, this Monica, um, asks, it's so nice to see you again, or to see your name, um, how, how that, it, how my advice would differ for somebody who's older and out of college and, and working toward being a writer. I would say when you're out of college, like really, you know, go to readings and, and really nurture your community and your readers, you know, and those might be people from previous workshops or, you know, friends, but, you know, keep, keep exchanging work, um, keep, keep that alive and, you know, be, be a good community member to, to, to the people you, who are kind enough to read your work. Um, I, I am so grateful for those relationships that I have and those really sustained me um, in the years when I was just toiling away. Um, yeah, what, what's your advice, Claire? Well, if you're younger, I think you're, you're freer, obviously, and you should take some big weird risks and like join the Civilian Conservation Corps or do some stuff for you and for stories and for exploring and waste some time while the economy improves or something, you know, I don't know. To be honest, I, I think often like how hard it would be to be a very young person starting out in the course of a career or life today because we haven't been good, they haven't had good stewards beforehand. And that's a lot of that's like, seems to be raining on our heads, you know, mm -hmm. thus us all being trapped in our houses. Uh, so I'm not, no one comes to me for advice anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, about, yeah, go oh, I really do like this question. Um, who's your first reader and when do you give your manuscript to them? My first reader um, is my um, former partner and um, I, I have to have I have to have a full draft um, a complete draft before anyone can see it um, but yeah 
Lydia is an amazing reader. <laughs> I did have a follow-up question too about um, workspaces and keeping notes on things. Um, Twyla Tharp famous, famously like keeps all of her projects in boxes once they're completely completed. She like saves all the notes and everything that went into them. Do you have a similar system where you save all of the scribbles and drafts in one place or even a place where you're putting scribbles and drafts for new projects? Um, or do you like to, you know, have it out there as this nice book when it's done and not save anything that went into it? I get a lot of pleasure when I have to print things out and make, make changes on a hard copy and I get a lot of pleasure out of recycling those pages when I'm done. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to keep them. That's completely fair. Um, here's a question. Which character in the Padilla family would you most like to share a meal or drink with and why? I think I, think I just want to be there at the family Easter dinner with them. Um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there's there's always drama and hilarity, and <laughs> I think I just want to yeah show up at the dinner, all of them. Um, a question for me: It seems like when writing um, family like this one, you have to think a lot about um, where am I creating um, dramatic structure around conflict between the family members and how am I revealing that history? Um, but I don't, you don't want too much because then it gets too intermixed and where are their alliances? How did you think about that when writing the book, the, like sort of the, the right balance between, you know, I want the conflicts to be clear where they are, but I also don't want it to get too fuddled with the plot. Yeah, you know, I I think we are our histories. You know, when I when at least when my family gathers, like it's it's like decades and decades and generations of of people who who show up as these ghosts and these sort of invisible pressures, um, and you know, old conflicts and old alliances and old jokes. Um, and so I knew that this book would, I, I knew that the, the family history would be an important part of the present moment um, for this family. I write a lot of backstory, way too much backstory. And so one of the tasks of revision is to weed out what isn't necessary. Um, I think there's still a lot of history in there, but um, yeah, fortunately not as much as there there was. <laughs> that sounds very similar to that idea of the actor preparing where you create this extensive backstory, but then um, what is on the page or what is brought forth to the world is actually so slight, but is enriched more because you wrote that long backstory. Um, so more on that on character traits, someone writes something I really cherish about the five wounds is the intimacy with which Amadeo's neuroses thinking in particular of his anxiety and bouts of germophobia are rendered as a part of his inner self, as well as something that informs his actions. How did that aspect of his character develop for you? Um, thank you for noticing that. Um, I, you know, I think poor, poor Amadeo is just kind of a baby, you know, his, really his difficulty is that he's so absorbed in his own story and in in his own immediate experience. And so, yeah, you know, poor Angel is giving birth and Amadeo is thinking about MRSA and is he gonna pick it up in the hospital? Um, I mean, now, of course, that doesn't seem <laughs> all that neurotic. Like, it seems totally reasonable <laughs> um, to be worried about, you know, picking up bugs um, in any kind of public space. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, his his task is really to recognize that other people have their own stories that are unfolding um, and to, to be interested in them. 
and he d he he gets there, you know. I think he he finds himself increasingly interested in other people's dramas. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, I thought the exact same thing about the <laughs> neuroses around being in a hospital. Um, maybe we'll close out with a two-part question. Um, we have one attendee who's asking, what are you working on now? And that can be to the both of you. Um, and then we at Politics and Prose have our own bonus question, which is for our authors and moderators, um, what are you currently reading besides, of course, the five wounds that you'd like to suggest or recommend to our audience? It can be fiction, nonfiction, um, you know, poetry, whatever you prefer. Um, so maybe you could each answer those questions of what are your next projects and what are you reading that's really enticing right now? Do you want to start, Claire? Yeah, sure. I just finished yesterday copy editing a new novel, so I'm working on nothing, like very happily. Um, the thing I have close at hand that I'm reading is um, this, it's called the Mojave Project Reader. It's by this artist and scholar named Kim Stringfellow, and she's just a brilliant, like, modern day um, anthropologist and like a cultural folk hero. This is a piece she did about open pit borax mining Gorgeous. in the Mojave Desert. Um, this, yeah, it's just like her gaze on the Mojave Desert is so special. Here's a spread about Marta Beckett's um, Amargosa Opera House outside of Death Valley. Wow. Um, she has like illuminated um, this region that I grew up in and that informs my work and I've learned so much from it. Here's a piece about the raging debates about endangered species at Devil's Hole, save the pupfish, kill the pupfish. Um, yeah, I think I, I would like to write uh, kind of the novel version of something like this, like a reader or a romp around a specific region, which is also just my, my all three of my books have been that so I'm just gonna I, I was just gonna say <laughs> <laughs> what can I say I got the one thing yeah it's called the Mojave Project Reader this is actually volume two it's a two volume thing and the author is Kim Stringfellow you can order it at um well politics and prose or her website <laughs> um I am working on stories and sort of um yeah, I'm working on stories right now and sort of working my way around a larger project, but I'm, I'm not committing to that in my heart yet. Um, and I just started Natasha Trethaway's um, memoir, Memorial Drive. Memorial Drive, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what it's called. Um, I'm, I'm just at the beginning of it though, and it's really lovely. Thank you. Thank the two of you so much for your recommendations and for this really great conversation. Um, we here at Politics and Prose want to thank again Kirsten Valdez Quaid, Claire Bay Watkins, and our audience out there for tuning in and for offering such great questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this type of live programming, and we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So please follow the link in the chat to purchase your copy of the five wounds or just visit politics-pros.com and while you're there you can stop by our events calendar to see what we've got coming up it'll be an exciting spring um, and from our shelves to yours we hope you're out there staying safe staying strong and of course staying well read and we will see you next time many thanks again thank you both thank you thank so you. much thank you claire so good to see you so good to see you my friend congratulations it's such a beauty oh thank you